Hello, this is your host, Todd Lewis, of the Praise of Folly podcast. Tonight I have a special guest, Davis Aruni. Uh, thanks for coming on, Davis. Very happy to be here. Um, so I caught the – sort of a little bit of a backstory. I caught the uh, – two two days ago you had the uh, video with uh, Jolly Crocodile and Matt Forney about the alt-right. And, and at the end, I think it was Jolly Crocodile asked you what needs to change. And you ended with something very interesting that I, I wish we saw more of. Is people need to be more virtuous. They need to man up. You know, they need to take responsibility and live for something more than just themselves. And that might be a good place to start. In, in what ways would you like to see uh, people, and when you say become more virtuous in order to fight back against this decadence, what, what exactly do you have in mind? What, were, what would you be thinking about? You know, uh, let, let's rip apart how hard that question is to answer in the first place. Because trying to answer that question in this, social milieu that we find ourselves in. It, it's like trying to describe a color that nobody has ever seen before. Um, the, the, like the question is like, the question boils down to what the hell are we supposed to do right now? And if you were to ask the question, how do I get laid more often? Well, that, that's very easy to answer, okay? There's plenty of books been published on how to get laid more often. If you were to ask, how am I supposed to make more money? Uh, well, either become a Wall Street scam artist or invent some useless product and start a giant Patreon to, to back it up. Uh, if you asked, you know, how do I gain control and become popular? Once again, tell people exactly what they want to hear and you will get a cult following from all of that. Uh, and so the, the irony of this damn question is that we lack the grammatical ability to orchestrate this question because we are a we are such a utilitarian civilization we are you know like i was just watching this video or reading it, i forget but it was, it was pointing out how like listen consumerism isn't isn't innately late stage capitalism consumerism is what happens when the powers that be decide that consumption is good and consumption, we're gonna, we're gonna kickstart the economy by making credit really cheap and by subsidizing all these people so they can buy more consumer goods. And so the result is a world where everybody has enough money to buy whatever stupid trinket is being sold nowadays, but nobody has enough money to actually buy property or to invest in a real education or to start a business you, you don't have the money for that but you have the money to buy every stupid trinket out there and so the question how do i make more money becomes a existential question of do you mean more money so that you can afford blow and prostitutes and mcmansions and you know like a brand new ski do or whatever garbage people are buying or do you mean more wealth because like the these fundamental aspects of valuation have become completely separated from one another. Oh, yeah. Um, and certainly your, your point earlier that you made that we lack the, the language or the, even the concept of virtue is, is definitely true. You know, when people talk about, you know, chastity, honesty, honor, the things you laugh about, you know, you sneer at it. Oh, you can't really believe that. Uh, you know, Tim Tebow, he's not really a virgin. Nobody believes that. You know, but because because those people can't actually behave that way and they project onto others their own defects, they don't think that other people can live the way that could live better than they do. And partly they can't conceive of it and partly they're afraid to admit it because once they admit it, then they then they realize how inadequate they are. Yeah, like there's, there's two things when you try and talk about being virtuous. The, the, the first at the first reason that you shouldn't be virtuous is why bother? You know, if I act like a lying, uh, shady, whatever, like if I act like a piece of garbage, it is very, very easy. If you go out and act like a piece of garbage, you will get laid tonight. If you go out and act like a piece of garbage, you will get hired at a very high position within a corporation. If you act like a piece of garbage, you can be a great politician. So why, why the hell should I hold myself to any standards when all these people with no standards get promoted. And then there's the, the second, like it's a double whammy. The, the other side of the problem is, 
is what's known as scandal within the church. That, listen, everybody falls short. And one of the things you'll see is that any, like anybody that's trying to be anything, anybody that's trying to be a decent person is going to get attacked for all of their shortcomings. And, and while, and ironically, when you attack people for their shortcomings, you enable the people that, that are the most hypocritical to take power. Um, let, let me give you a, a real world example for this. If you are a contractor and you approach a client and say, well, what exactly is it that you want? How, what are the problems you're dealing with? I want to make sure I can do a good job. You know, you, that's, that's bit number one. Bit number two is, hey, don't worry, dog. I got this. I'm an expert. Nine times out of 10, the second guy is going to get hired in today's status quo. And he's going to be a scam artist. He's going to, like, he doesn't know what the hell he's doing. He's scammed himself into having a job. And so what we wind up with, we wind up with priests who are sex addicts, who are, you know, like dating trannies on the side, you name it. And so this discredits all priests. But if you're trying to be genuine and overcome your flaws, you know, you're, you're swept up with all of this. Like, oh, look, he admitted to having flaws. Then he must be a scam artist. So on the one hand, there's so little profit in being virtuous. And at the same time, it is so easy to create scandal, gossip, rumors about how anybody that falls short is not worth following. And so the only people we follow are the people that are least worth following. <laughs> You know, that is so true. A perfect example in real life would be the fall of Jimmy Swaggart versus Bill Clinton. Both men were caught in sexual scandals, but because Jimmy Swaggart was a Christian and held to a certain set of standards and he fell short, he got busted wide open because Bill Clinton had no standards. Everybody just let it slide. Yes, yes. When, um, yeah, when Bill Clinton does something, it's funny. It's a big joke. So you expect Bill Clinton to be a piece of slime yes yes i i think as far as now um as when you said people need to be more virtuous the the first thing that i thought of was um aristotle and his uh nicomachean ethics uh i don't know if you've read the nicomachean ethics but uh i read it in college and i read it i think i read it again out of college too it's really good and he talks about basically virtue is hard to achieve. Virtue is a, is, a, is a hard struggle. And you do that by practicing certain kinds of behaviors that are inclined to make you more virtuous. And when you do it enough, it becomes a habit. And when it becomes a habit, it becomes easier to do. But from getting to when you don't have the habit to when you're getting the habit can be very difficult. Well, and one of the, the difficulties these days is that we, we no longer practice goodness we practice niceness. So if you... Oh, yeah. Correctness is one example of niceness. Political correctness is about making sure that nobody feels excluded, nobody has their feelings hurt, nobody feels like they've fallen short of anything. Unless and, you're a white, straight Christian male. <laughs> well, unless if you're actually trying to live up to some sort of standard. Now, like ideally, if you're trying to live up to a standard, it should be a standard that, you know, you're not living up to already. Like if you already live up to your damn standards, then what's the point to having any standards? Okay, like if, if wallowing in your, your own filth is your moral standard, well, it, congratulations, you just succeeded. If you're actually aiming for anything, you're constantly going to fall short. You know, like an Olympic athlete doesn't become an Olympic athlete by trying to run the, the four miles in 10 minutes. Okay, any, anybody can do that, or the, 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 the 10 minute mile. It's by trying to beat the four minute mile that they become an Olympic athlete. And because there's a lot of struggle that goes into trying to achieve any of these standards, people say that, oh, it's, it's these standards that are making you depressed. These standards are making you antisocial. These standards are what have you. And so instead of a societal dedication to greatness, to virtue, to goodness, we have a social dedication to niceness. The lowest common denominator is what we aspire to. Oh, exactly. Um, one, one possible way to make virtue uh, something that's no longer a lost language 
Um, back in the 90s, uh, William J. Bennett, who uh, had previously been Ronald Reagan's uh, education czar, wrote a book called The Book of Virtues, where he goes through the, 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 the basic virtues, you know, courage, justice, honor, prudence, all those things. And he has a medley of stories that, it, that are examples of these virtues from all over the world. You know, the Bible, Native American mythology, uh, you know, historical examples. And he put them all in this book that sort of gives people a example to look up to that exemplifies the virtue of honesty or the virtue of courage. And I think something like that could be very helpful in helping people realize what, what virtue is. What does it look like to be virtuous? There's, one, when this, there's this great story of Alfred the Great, who, when he was on the run from the Vikings, when he was uh, being attacked, he, he goes into this cottage, and this peasant woman is baking bread, and he asks to be let in, and she lets him in. And then she says she has to go run some errands, and he has to watch the bread to make sure it doesn't burn. And as it's, he's thinking about the fate of England, what happens is he lets the bread burn. And when she comes back in, she chews him out. Because, you know, she doesn't know he's the king. He's just a disheveled wanderer. And he just sucks it up. He's like, yeah, I gave you my word. I was supposed to watch the bread, and it burned. And that, that, is, that, is, that is virtue. And that's, from a, that's a king who takes lip from a peasant woman who he gave his word of honor to. And that's, those are the kind of examples that we should be giving people that would inspire them to live beyond themselves and to live for something more. Yeah, I've mentioned, I'm still working my way through Quintus Curtius's latest book, uh, Sallust. And the one thing that, in his, uh, like he starts off by making, Sallust is, Sallust is a Roman historian who was, you know, somewhat involved in politics. He kind of worked with Julius Caesar. He was, you know, he was not big enough that you're going to read a Shakespeare story about him, but he was kind of big. He was involved in all of this stuff. And he eventually... After all of this garbage, he retired after doing politics, after doing war, he retired, built a villa, and became a historian. And one of the things that Quintus points out, part of the reason I love this character, uh, the, like the, the character of Sallust, this historical man, is that he, Quintus points out that, you know, there was a whole, no, there's a big moral scandal about, you know, Sallust maybe being a little bit too loose and easy with the women when he was younger. Which is the sort of thing that if you were wealthy, if you were Bill Clinton, you could get away with that to the ends of the earth. Whereas Sallust was a, an upstart. He was a middle class family that had jumped up into the upper class. And so when he did the exact same thing everybody else was doing, he got berated for it endlessly. And so that, <laughs> this is part of the reason I like the character, because I can certainly recognize those flaws within myself. But it's, it's this, he, he writes a virtuous history like he is studying history through the lens of virtue and again you know what it was quintus courteous that pointed this out when he was berating uh mark zuckerberg's sister who had the had the audacity to try and criticize him and criticize the classics for being about old dead white men it's like well what do you think the classics are about sweetheart uh, not, there's not enough people of color in roman history <laughs> that's that's the problem with it um but he, he pointed out and I'm, I'm going to include this when I review the book, that modern history is very dry because we refuse to do a moral analysis. We try and do a objective scientific analysis, which is nothing but a pretense. You, you cannot do a scientific analysis of history. There is no such thing as a, an objective materialistic view of history. History is about narrative. It is about different groups claiming the moral right and trying to be virtuous. And, and when, as soon as you enter the materialistic dialectic, as soon as you say that, well, everybody that, everybody that wins tries to be morally better than their enemies, as soon as you ignore the fact that morality actually is a part of history, you, complete, you blind yourself to what's actually going on with any of it. Undertow on one of my live streams about a week or so ago, who pointed out that, and he was quoting Jordan B. Peterson, you know what ended the Soviet Union? It was Solzhenitsyn looking out at the horrors of the Gulag Archipelago and not asking the question, why did Stalin do this to me? 
he asked the question, how did I deserve this fate? How did we, the Russian people, deserve this fate? And he returned back to that, that core of self-knowledge, which is, is what virtue is. Anybody that's pursuing virtue, it's usually because they've figured out that they're not a very virtuous person. And it's doing that that creates the change for the better. You know, it, it's not, and damn it, man. Damn it. Like right now, like we, we, we hit peak leftism. And leftism is the height of self righteousness, of, of people pretending. Look how tolerant I am of blacks, even though I live in a completely white neighborhood. Yeah, like it's, it's the height of hypocrisy. It's calling, like, I was born rich and I give money to the poor. I'm virtuous. No, no, charity is when you're poor and you still give money to the poor. So we, we finally defeated peak leftism. But what worries me, what frustrates me, is that we're replacing that form of hypocrisy, that form of false virtue, with our own form of false virtue. You know, and just like the most obvious example is that whites are far better at covering up their dysfunction than blacks are. You know, like you look at a black in the ghetto, they're obviously dysfunctional. Okay. <laughs> you have to be a damn liberal to think they aren't dysfunctional. But that doesn't mean that we aren't as well. We're just whatever higher IQ or we're better socialized, whatever it is, we are better at covering it up. And virtue is when even though you've gotten away with multiple crimes, like even though you've gotten away with driving drunk a dozen times in your life, you wake up and say, you know what? I got to stop doing this shit because I'm eventually going to get pulled over for drunk driving or worse, I'm going to kill somebody. I need to get a grip on my kit and sort myself out. You know, not, not because, you know, I'm not going to wait until I get arrested to sort myself out. I'm going to try and sort myself out right now. Yeah. We, um, we need more of that. Yeah. The, 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 you know, Plato said that, you know, men, men will tend to look at the, the long-term self-interest is harder for humans to look at because we very tend to have short time preferences. And, you know, in the long run, for instance, eating a lot of uh, fast food is going to clog your arteries and make you fat. But in the short term, it, you know, it feels good. And so it's really hard to get people to think in long-term processes. You know, if you don't get caught over and over again, you think, oh, I'll never get caught. But then, or, or I'll never crash. And then, of course, it happens. And it's, it's, it's really tragic. Now, given your sort of um, uh, influence or experience in the manosphere and in MGTOW, one of the things that I think is somewhat overlooked that is uh, crucial to this virtue uh, nexus is um, the male fraternity. Aristotle, in his uh, politics, discusses how uh, a society, a polity, is organized. And he says that um, the, a polity is organized around men that love one another's souls. They, they're right, there's three levels of friendship, the highest being the love of the good in the other person's soul. So a virtuous man has a beautiful soul, and you love what he has because he's objectively good. And then men that come together with the shared bond of love uh, because of this can then become a bulwark against tyranny and corruption and vice. And I think that feminism is one of the tips of the spear that has been used to destroy male fraternities. I mean, for instance, a few, uh, was a, a decade or so ago, VMI was sued because it didn't allow women to join the, uh, the training courses. And, you know, any sort of all-male space is immediately sued. Uh, and, and forced to integrate. And of course, the, the female component dramatically changes the component of it. And this, 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 this male, fr male fraternities, uh, the only way you can really have one is through this sort of caricature of, of internet gaming. It's, it's not even, it, it tricks men into thinking they have a real fraternity when they don't. But there's nowhere else for them to go. And even, in, you know, but, but that's, I think, one of the key elements that the left has been trying to destroy because Male fraternities, based in the love of the virtue in one another, is one of the, the, the strongest bulwarks against tyranny and corruption and vice and cultural degradation that there is. And that's a lost art that needs to be rediscovered, I think. 
You know, I'd like to bring in a two other con, and they're, they're actually the same damn concept. But um, like, like first, like, Jordan B. Peterson loves to talk about the dominance hierarchy. You know how depression is what happens when you're at the bottom of the the dominance hierarchy when you, you you're a freaking loser and you've got no purpose in society whatsoever. And um, and you know, like we, we are designed for tribes of about 150 people, something like that. And, you know, where there are so few places left in the dominance hierarchy, which frustrates a lot of men. Now, the, the other concept that I think is very connected to this is the, the political, philosophical concept of federalism, which federalism, it's an old idea, goes back several hundred years. The idea that you should have a every step of government should be grassroots that government you know starts with the community and the church and then it goes into the you know the district and then into the state and then to the federal government federalism is actually about the the very gr like grassroots distribution of power that you know what you might just be a farmer in a small town and so, you know, farmer, like, obviously you shouldn't be showing up at, you know, Washington to dictate whether or not we start a war with, you know, land war in Asia, but that you have a meaningful role and contribution and some, some say in the community. Like you have a position in that dominance hierarchy. And now, now I'm going to bring this back to feminism. So post-World War II, you know, we suddenly we had this mass dominance hierarchy. Pre World War II, small towns were very, very independent. Okay, we didn't have the same form of travel, the same ubiquity of culture. You know, you went to a small town. It did not matter if you were a really big fish in your small town. You were starting out all over again at the bottom of the bottom of the dominance hierarchy, trying to fit in with these new people that you just met. But following World War II. Suddenly, we had the mass culture, the, the mass dominance hierarchy. And so all these vets, you know, they, they just suffered 15 years of hell. Okay, Great Depression, World War II, you know, 15 years of hell. And all the women felt the exact same way. And all these people said, yo, yo, just give me a really boring life with like a cookie cutter house, and I'll be happy with that. And all these people settled down into their boring, bland, 1950s lifestyle that would choke the life out of anybody here. They all settled down into that, except for the groups that didn't fit in. And the groups that didn't fit in, this is where we get the biker gangs. These were the people, they came back from World War II, and for whatever reason, they did not fit in to the, the track houses, 1950s, leave it to be for society. All right, now, the Leave it to Beaver Society, most of these people, like you are a low on the totem pole, but you're on the freaking totem pole. So you get to have an air conditioner and a wife and one car and a shitty fucking job, but they're not going to lay you off, et cetera. That's good enough. I'm low on the totem pole, but at least I'm on the freaking totem pole. Then you get the, the bikers. These were the guys that came back and they just, for whatever reason, some of them, it's because they were losers and drug addicts. Others, it was because they were very creative. They were way too smart. These are the people that formed biker gangs, the, the alternative counterculture. Well, what's happened since then? So we, we, we went from like 1930s, every society, every town was its own dominance hierarchy. We go to the 1950s. You have one big dominance hierarchy that is all of America. And then the alternative culture, which is its own dominant hierarchy. And then you come to the present day where the biker gangs have been completely co-opted. The alternative, I mean, you're not being a rebel by doing drugs and listening to like rock and roll. Okay, that's not rebellion anymore. That is the norm. And so all subcultures have been subsumed into the, the megaculture. And all of us are at the bottom of this dominance hierarchy. 
and so uh, now the way this kind of relates to the alternative right to what's happening politically is you know you've got bernie sanders supporters and they're pissed off because minimum wage should be 15 bucks an hour and they're right it should be 15 bucks an hour the problem is that passing a law ain't gonna make it so um but i i feel where they're coming from they're very angry because they're at the bottom of the dominance hierarchy they are broke they have no opportunities they owe all the student debt and you know what the hell are they supposed to do with themselves then you, then you get the the alternative right it's the exact same thing it's all like you're a white male and your opinion doesn't matter you're a white male so you are a piece of garbage unless you're one of the one percent white males unless you're an actor in hollywood or if you are you know there's some scam artist on wall street or you run a corporation if you're a white male we don't give a shit about you and so you get all these people they are at the bottom of the dominance hierarchy and they are desperate for anything to provide them meaning but they fight against each other so that, that this is the you know, like the the biker gangs were rebelling against society what are you rebelling against whatever you got but at least they were doing something and the bitches loved them these days it's we're at the bottom of the dominance hierarchy and we can't find anything to do but fight against each other whether it's antifa versus alt-right or alt-right versus alt-right because i mean as soon as we run out of antifa to fight we fight each other and as soon as the left runs out of people on the right to attack they fight each other we are we are desperately searching for this validation and meaning and opportunity and hope but we're doing it in, in completely the wrong ways yeah yeah um one thing that I to maybe double back to the uh, to framing the 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 actual discussion is the decline and decadence of the West. I, I think the the question is where do we pinpoint the de the beginning of this decadence? I think that most reactionaries and traditionalists and alt writers would agree that in 1914 Europe and North America was relatively healthy. Um, and so after 1914. I, there's a lot of factors involved, but certainly the Great War had did not help. It led to the Bolshevism, uh, led to a lot of disillusionment, and then you had the Great Depression. Then you had another World War, and really Europe kind of killed itself. I think that's really the beginning of the rise of the decadence. They conquered the world during the 19th century, and having no one else to fight, they fought each other, and they blew up Europe twice, and in so doing, Europe uh, destroyed itself. I, I know isn't it funny that we call this this suicidal european war we call it the world war now i mean there's I, i'm a big fan of looking at historical cycles and i think what happened uh particularly during the 19th century is that we we synced up the rest of the world to our historical clock okay like these days everywhere in the world they wear business suits everywhere in the world the the military uses the same honorifics and the same structure as the western military they all dress in green these days in the army whatever country it is um but it, it's funny that, that yes europe achieved this global dominance but world war one and world war two yeah we kind of we sucked the rest of the world into it but these were these were it's like a mafia family where the brothers and sisters hate one another and so there's a giant mafia war that sucks in the entire italian peninsula but really it's just this internecine conflict between brothers and sisters and 1914 world war one is in my view that's when the diagnosis of melanoma came back we were sick for quite a long time before that and things were building up to this point and world war one was when we first, yeah, you know, that's that's when we had to deal with it. That's when it became obvious. You know, like the Napoleonic Wars throughout Europe. I mean, like what what the hell were those? You know, like French the the French civilization decides that they're going to decapitate themselves. They're going to kill off all the rulers. Then they elect a whole bunch of SJWs who decide to murder everybody that looks at them crosswise. And then finally you get Napoleon, who's, you know, a tyrannical dictator, but at least he stopped killing French people. 
and he starts a war with the rest of Europe for no fucking reason whatsoever, and he manages to win the damn thing. You know, World War I was just, just the, this is saying like, listen, European man, you thought you could live on reason alone? You thought you were smarter than, now I'm going to say smarter than God. I want to qualify this. Um, and, and, you know, I'm going to steal from Jordan B. Peterson again. Jordan B. Peterson has pointed out, like, listen, I worship God because if I don't, I'm going to start worshiping something else. I'm going to say, I'm going to say to myself, I worship God because then I at least, whether or not God exists, it's better to worship God than it is to worship scientism or to worship money or to worship sex or to worship, because you are going to worship something. So even if God doesn't exist, you know, you better be worshiping God or you're going to be worshiping something really, really destructive. And, and that's what European man did. We, we stopped worshiping God and we started worshiping our own intellects. And, you know, French Revolution, World War I, World War II, communism, Nazism, death camps, genocides, that's, that was our reward. That, we are so freaking smart we destroyed our civilization for no goddamn reason. We destroyed our civilization because the howitzers said, please feed me more ammo. And the only logical thing to do to an empty howitzer is to shove another round into it and go bomb a bunch of German peasants. Well, exactly. Um, that, that reminds me, there was um, Jacques Ellul, the um, Christian anarchist, when he described Christian uh, technological society, he said, people do these terrible things to meet quotas, to meet production quotas, to meet uh, assignment quotas. They don't even think of the ramifications of it. I just, I just have to meet the deadline. And if that means blowing up a million people, well, that's meeting the deadline. Um, I, you know, in why history... A TPS report? Because the TPS report needs to be filled out. Why, why are you asking these stupid questions about why are we doing TPS reports? Exactly. Very seldom in history is there one cause for an event. But I think the death of the West, the ticking time bomb was laid with the idea of nominalism. Nominalism is the idea that there are no universals. Uh, and when you deny universals, you end up with SJWs because you can have trains and, you know, uh, you know, cat people or, you know, gender fluid. Because, hey, you know, there's no fixed natures. When you deny fixed natures, you open the door, you open the devil's uh, toolbox up. And by denying fixed natures, that there are any natures whatsoever, uh, then the sky is the limit, man. And then once you get to that point, the Renaissance can happen where they say, oh, you know, this God stuff, oh, bag that. We got human reason. And then, of course, the human reason chained into nihilism or nominalism, rather, denying universal forms and natures. I mean, the entire left is predicated on the denial of nature. If nature isn't real, then you can make anything whatever you want. But if nature is real, then you can't change it. There's a, you mentioned MGTOW earlier. The first guy to coin the term, he's actually abandoned the term because MGTOW has become its own uh, little destruction spiral. But the, the original MGTOWs, he, Rob Fetters, he pointed out the, the triune nature of truth, where there, is, there are three forms of truth. There is subjective truth, and that, that, that's your... That's your personal truth, okay? And, and it matters, okay? Your feelings actually do matter. If you feel like shit, you're not going to do a very good job today. Um, your personal preferences, I like this music, like that is very subjective, but it is a form of truth. Uh, then you've got the objective truth, which is the materialistic scientific truth that we can all go and say, yes, that car is red. You know, and maybe you like red, maybe you don't like red. That's your subjective truth. But we can all objectively agree that two plus two equals four. Uh, but above that, the highest form of truth is the absolute truth. It's that ineffable truth. And, you know, I'm, I've gone on about this before. I'm not going to go into too much depth right now. But when it comes right down to it, there... there there are ontological assumptions underlying everything. Okay, like two plus two equals four. You know, the, the postmodernists who have completely fallen into subjective truth say that two plus two equals four is a cultural hegemonic 
opinion that we just we we rape the Chinese people into believing two plus two equals four. We rape them with our brains. Um, but you know they kind of have a point in that two plus two equals four is not. We can't prove that. You have to make a whole bunch of assumptions. You have to assume that there is there is this absolute view of the universe, this absolute word of the universe that means that two plus two always equals four, whether or not you like it. You need that absolute truth. You need God there. So as soon as you abandon God and you go down to that objective truth, the scientific truth, the mathematical truth, well, suddenly that scientific and mathematical truth isn't based upon anything. You know, it's like utilitarianism. Utilitarianism starts off, it starts off latched to the absolute. It says that if we can do something that will reduce the amount of suffering in the world, we should do that. We should promote good over evil using our reason and our logic. But you need an assumption about what is good and what is evil. As soon as you abandon that, that faith in the absolute, what becomes good becomes what makes people happy. And getting a goddamn toy with your, your Happy Meal makes people happy, even though it doesn't give them any, any catharsis, any meaning or purpose or any insight. It makes them happy. So instead of, you know, instead of more Bibles, we need more Happy Meal toys. And soon enough, the whole society, you know, well, some people aren't happy being married. And so married is no longer about being a better man, you know, like learning to be like Christ and guide your wife, even though you're an imperfect man, or learning to also be like Christ and, and submit and follow and be a better woman. No, no, no. Suddenly marriage is about being happy. And if it, well, what's happy, happiness is whatever gets me off in five minutes. And so that it, when you abandon the absolute truth and you worship the objective truth, you worship scientism, scientism quickly falls into the subjective truth where it's however people feel is all that matters anymore. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, this is kind of a, a simplistic example, but I think it does show the degeneracy in the West. You know, I call it the Mozart to Madonna. You know, we have, you know, say Mozart's Symphony Number no. 41, the Jupiter. And then we have Madonna's Material Girl. And you ask yourself, how did we get here? How did we go from something so sublime, so celestial as Mozart or, or, or Handel's Messiah? And now we have, you know, Miley Cyrus's Wrecking Ball. And it's like, if, if there was any indication of degeneracy from where we were, you know, we 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 were we were at we were on top of Mount Olympus. We were we were we were we had we had stolen fire from the gods at that point, and then all of a sudden, we just because we accept nihilism and nominalism, we put a gun to our head, pull the trigger, and ended up with Madonna. You know what? What you said, we stole fire from the gods. Uh, I ran into this this web comic on 4chan, where this this white guy goes up to a black guy. And he's carrying, a, he's carrying a box that says civilization. And he's like, here you go. I made this. And the black guy goes, you made this? I made this. Then it catches on fire. And the white guy comes back and says, hey, what did you do? And the black guy says, you broke this. Now that's... <laughs> it, it, it's hilarious because, you know, that's all these Black Lives Matter riots. but. You know what? I actually think that perfectly sums up what you just said, because, you know, listen, um, there was one African society that was worth a goddamn, and it was a Christian monarchy. Ethiopia. Yep. So God gave us the fire. But then we said, you invented it, and I invented this. We said that we, you know, either made the fire or stole the fire from the gods. And as soon as we said that, as soon as we took this gift and said, I earned this, that's when it fell to shit. You know, that's actually a really good point. 
it reminds me of in uh, the Silmarillion when uh, Morgoth tries to find the secret fire of creation of Ur Luvatar. It's it it is it Ur Luvatar's own essence that the the secret fire exists. Whereas Morgoth thought he could steal it, and in trying to steal it, he rebelled against the perfect rule of Uru and ruined Middle Earth. Well, it's the exact same story in in uh, was it Sorcerer's Apprentice, C.S. Lewis, where the the White Witch breaks into the the garden and steals the apple of eternal life. And yeah, she gets eternal life out of it, but it's not what she bargained for. You you can't steal a gift. You know, and, and there's some there's nothing more humbling than receiving a gift. You know, when somebody actually gives you a gift and you accept it humbly, you try and make the most of that gift. As opposed to stealing it, you feel like you're clever. Look at me, I stole this gift. I know, heck, we could talk about welfare and how, you know, like actual charity is you're, you're humbled and it's like, I'll try and be worthy of receiving this. You get welfare, it's like, ha I'm clever, I scammed the government out of money. Yeah, yeah. And and what's interesting is if you look at the, the, the non-Western world, for instance, when I was at school, I, uh, you, know, you got to take your classes on African history, I guess. Well, that's part of the way they teach a curricula now. And there's this one story that always stuck with me. It was in Nigeria. It was, you know, pre-colonial story where there was this, this warrior who was very, he was, he was uh, uh, brave and courageous, but also lazy. And he tricks other people into doing work for him. And he's the hero of the story because he doesn't have to do any work. Whereas in the Western tradition, specifically beginning with uh, Christianity, uh, work is itself ennobling. Work is when you work, you're recapitulating the days of creation. You're recapitulating what God did. And in so doing, it ennobles work. Whereas in the pagan world, in the non-Western world, work was seen as something that was demeaning, uh, something that was a nuisance. But only in the Christian West did did work become something that was divine. And you know what? Uh, you just brought to mind Huckleberry Finn, where <laughs> yeah, I, I don't remember which character it was. I don't think it was Huckleberry. I think he was the, but it's the author where, where he convinces everybody to paint the fence for him because he tells them it's a game and he doesn't do any work, but then he gets paid for it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah and hey, listen, I, he's a great writer. Okay. I'm not saying he's not a great writer, but ain't that the capitalist ethos trick people into working for pennies on the dollar while you yes. do nothing at all, as opposed to build up and earn and create a business because because cre cre you don't create a business to get wealthy, okay? Wealth is kind of the side effect from creating a good business. You create a good business because it's a good business in and of itself. And, and th so this is the difficulty with saying, what, what is virtue? Virtue is the color you've never seen. You know, it's saying that's truth. You know, these days, truth is whatever gets you laid. Truth is whatever will get you out of court. As opposed to this, this ontological, this this absolute word. Yeah, you know, it, rem also, it reminds me of um, in C.S. Lewis's Voyage of the Dawn Treader, uh, uh, Lucy, when she's reading through the magic book in the tower, she reads a story, but then when she turns the next page, she can't turn it back, and she forgets what the story was. But it was the perfect story. And, and, and C.S. Lewis then said, whenever Lucy heard a story that she really liked, she said it reminded her of that perfect story, but she could never quite remember the whole thing. Well, you know, and that's something else C.S. Lewis has touched on, that there's a certain hunger in us for the sublime. There's, every so often we get a glimpse of it, there's something that reminds us of it, and for just, for the briefest moment, we feel like, shoot, this is where I belong. This feels good. And it's just the subtlest thing, and then it's gone. That, that there is this deeper hunger in all of us for something more than just the material, more than just the objective. And 
And actually, you know, to go just back to C.S. Lewis in the Silver Chair, where the the uh, what's her what's her name the the witch is trying to the green uh, witch, the lady, the green girdle, yeah. Yes, and she is trying to seduce them and trying to delude them, and they're saying that no, no, I remember Aslan; he's like a cat, only bigger. And I remember the sun; it's like a lamp, only brighter. And she's saying, well, you just imagined all of this stuff. And the, the polywog, but ma'am, maybe there is no Aslan, maybe it's all humbug, but I'd rather spend the rest of my days searching through these tunnels for Aslan, because that's better than living with this lamp. You know, I'd rather keep looking for the sun than just live with this lamp. And so that's, um, oh, shoot, what's, what's the atheist love to criticize us with one? What's the uh, Pascal's wager? Yeah, Pascal's That is Pascal's wager right there, is that I would rather keep looking for the sun. I would rather keep looking for that, that thing, that story I heard way back. I can't even remember what it was about, but I heard it. I want to keep looking for that beauty, that virtue. I want to keep pursuing that, even if it doesn't exist. My life is better for pursuing that than living underground with the Beatles and the hedonists and all of this that we need oh. to find a bit in our lives. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, there's this great, uh, um, the, the sort of, uh, I don't know what kind of, what you call it, the band, the, the Blind Guardian band. They're, they're one of the great bands out there singing. They, all their songs are based on like traditional western archetypes of heroism and tragedy they have like nightfall in middle earth one of the one of the best albums ever but they have a one called punishment divine which is part of their uh, night in the opera and it's about nietzsche going insane and one of the lines is joyfully it seems but then suddenly by one false move it's blown away joyfully it seems but then suddenly their voices cease it's gone away vanish to the point of no return you see, it's like we see these echoes of the divine, and we only see them for a moment. And then when they disappear, what do we do with that? Do we, do we pursue more, or we just forget about it and go back into our stupor? And I think that's, like, what we need to do as a Western man is get out of our stupor. That it's not enough to say that we was Romans and shit. It's not enough to be prideful in what we are right now we need to we need to be on that eternal journey we need to be on that eternal odyssey and that success like listen materialistic success all of that that happens yeah you know the saying that life is what happens to you when you're making other plans mm -hmm. well if you're making plans to be financially successful or to be whatever, to be successful in this predefined way, while you're pursuing that life is going to happen to you. And what you're setting your eyes on is going to determine the, the journey. Like you might, you might never reach the moon, but if you're aiming for the moon, you'll go somewhere interesting in the process. Yeah, that reminds me, C.S. Lewis said that if men aim for earth, they don't achieve anything. If they aim for heaven, they improve our status on earth. But as soon as we start celebrating that status we already have. Mm -hmm. And and you mentioned something hard. earlier that you mentioned something earlier that reminded me of being a part of the ever seeking journey for truth. It reminds me of the Lord of the Rings where Bilbo Baggins writes his account of his journey to the mountain with the dwarves. And then the book is passed on to Frodo, who writes about his journey in the War of the Ring. And then at the end of the book, he says, There's room left for you, Sam. And so Samwise continues the story. You have this generation of hobbits keeping this story alive. And it's part of this uh, traditional Western epic of we're walking in this story uh, that's leading towards the truth, that's leading towards redemption. And we have to pass on the torch to the next generation when we are done. Bilbo passes it on to Frodo, Frodo passes it on to Sam. And Sam, we expect to pass it on to his children. And and I think that's a really beautiful analogy that Tolkien gives us of the point that you made. You know, what you just said about beauty. We have, um, like, we, 
Western civilization hasn't stood for anything in a long time. One of the possible errors we're making on the right is that we are too focused on the truth and the truth alone because like leftist economics, leftist culture, it is so blatantly false. It's such an obvious lie that we hold up the truth as this response to it. But the truth is not everything there is, you know, and that quickly becomes co-opted by the, the scientism where scientific truth is all that is. Uh, there's two other things. There, there's truth, goodness, and beauty. And I think goodness and beauty are just as important and that we need to be rediscovering those things. And the thing about beauty, especially, beauty is terrifying. Beauty is intimidating. Beauty is like, listen, you can turn on a, you can turn on the, the radio and you'll hear something pretty. You'll hear some good chords and some good rhythms and some lyrics that run. It's pretty, but it doesn't challenge you. Okay, beauty is terrifying you. You, know, you, can, you can look at a young 18-year-old girl, and she's pretty. She doesn't have any lines in her face. She's got curves. That's pretty. It's fun to be around. It, it mellows the mind when you've got a pretty waitress. Being around a woman, appreciating a woman as a wife, watching her earn her status as mother and wife is painful. Real beauty hurts. And I think we need more, more beauty. You know, not prettiness, but beauty. That beauty challenges you in the same way that truth challenges you. And it's very uncomfortable, but it's very profound. Yeah, and we need so, more of that. Psalm 50 Verse two, out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God is shown forth. God is the perfection of beauty, and he is terrifying in part because of that. Beauty, tr truth, and goodness are absolutely terrifying. There is nothing more frightening than the hell is less frightening than those. That's why so many people choose to go there. Well, the, the other thing is, uh, you, you, we, we talk about truth, beauty, and goodness. And when we look at the, the alternative leftist atheism, it's, it's so ugly. Ugliness is the norm. You know, Christendom created Tolstoy and Shakespeare and Milton and Poe and Handel and Newton and all these great creators. And you look at the, you know, we look at... Uh, the atheist materialist culture, and uh, arguably one of the greatest English writers of the 20th century, H.P. Lovecraft, his, 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 his greatness lies in articulating the terror of the ugly, the tentacles, the monsters, not the terror of the beautiful. Um, and, and as an atheist, he can't do that. He can't tap into that. Or if he does, he's doing it on his borrowed Calvinist heritage. And we see this degradation of art and culture, this increasing ugliness as the left and materialism and atheism expand. And it's almost like it's it's almost like you have uh, like Sauron just hollowing out the entire environment, not just the cities or the people, but the actual environment is polluted and it's dying. Like literally, the entire ecosystem is dying, as as like the left and materialism spread like Sauron's orcs through our society. Well, and think about those orcs for a moment. Think about when uh, uh, Frodo and Samwise have to put on outfits and go embed themselves in an orc troop. The, the orcs aren't surprising. The orcs are ugly and nasty and horrible, but they're not surprising. They're like prison. You know exactly what you're in for when you go to prison, you know, and you just you knuckle down and you deal with it. Whereas the, the elves, when they're in the elven city, it is, it's awful. It is terrifying how beautiful and profound the elves are. It's, it, it's a different form of horror, you know? And so we, we've abandoned the horror of the elves, of these, these eternal beings that painfully feel everything for the 
the tawdry horror of the orcs. Yeah, I think the word you're looking for is awful. Not in the sense of bad, but is it a, as in a sense of a source of awe. We, all, we often hear Christians say that God is awful in the sense that his awe inspires so much fear that we tremble. And you're right. I mean, Galadriel, when she's offered the ring of power, says you would trade a dark lord for one that is beautiful and terrifying, but it would no less repressive. Um, and well, and that's exactly what the awful C.S. Lewis points us out that you know, if if I told you there's a tiger in the next room, you'd feel afraid if you believed me. But if I told you there was a ghost in the next room, and you believed it, you know, you like why are you afraid of a ghost? But you would be afraid of the ghost. It's awful. The the tiger is scary. The ghost is awful. Because you can't control the ghost. It's beyond your power. A tiger you can control. You can manage with the proper training and technology. But I mean, the damn thing might eat you, but you know, yeah. you, you understand how it's going to eat you. You don't know what the ghost is going to do. Is it going to rattle its chains at you and say, I'm in hell and Ebenezer, you are choosing to join me? Because that's awful. The tiger's just going to eat your ass. Yeah, it reminds me of what Christ said. Uh, be not afraid of those who can destroy the body, but those who can destroy the body in soul and hell. And so, you know, the tiger is analogous to the guy that can destroy the body. The supernatural terror is the terror that can destroy the soul, which is ultimately God and far more terrifying. Well, and and that's what we see every direction that we turn. We, we see these easy, soul-destroying de opportunities. And, you know, and here's the, here's the bloody irony. Okay, because I, I don't want to say any of this like I'm somehow above it all, because I'm not. You know, this is, this is what I'm trying to rise above every single day. Uh, and the, the damned irony in our society is that if you are a drug addict, if you are a whatever it might be, if you're addicted to money, if you're a slave, if, you're, if you are broken, there's a place for you. We take care of broken people. We make it so bloody easy to be broken. But if you actually try and have any integrity, if you try and stand up for anything, it's just an endless pressure cooker. Exactly. You know, this reminds me, this reminds me of Pascal. Pascal wrote that why do men engage in gambling, hunting, card playing, uh, prostitution, alcoholism? Because in the quiet of the mind, God is present in the awful, overwhelming power and fear of God, right? You know, and Isaiah says that God was not in the loud noises. He was in the quietness after all of the thunder and lightning. And it's that quietness that when we do not drown it out with drugs or sex or music or whatever, we have to think about it. And when we confront it, we're terrified. And so to avoid confrontation, that confronting that silentness in us, we divert ourselves endlessly to our own destruction. You know, in Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, uh, he, he opened it with the quote, he who makes a beast of himself gets rid of the pain of being a man. Yeah, that's, that's so true. Um, you know, this kind of gets into a kind of a utilitarianism as well, because when, um, what was his name, a Bentham, made the claim that, you know, it's all about maximizing pleasure, maximizing the utility of pleasure. And then Carlyle said, yeah, but by that matrix, a pig is happier than a man. And that, that, that led to Mill saying, I'd rather be a man unsatisfied than a pig satisfied. But, but by saying that, Mill rejected utilitarianism because there's something more than just pleasure and satisfaction to live for. You know, and the damn irony about maximizing pleasure is that pleasure works on a, a asymptotic measure. You know, the first time you kiss a girl, it's the most exciting thing in the world. You know, by the time you, I mean, what's that that book called? Uh, the the one with the Cenobites, the Telltale, not the Telltale Heart. Um, hmm, I don't know, but it sounds like marginal utility. The more you do it, the less returns you get from it. Yeah, it's that great uh, that great horror movie with the the Cenobites, you know, Pinhead. 
you know, the, the realm of absolute sensation. It's mm -hmm. that, you know, it, basically the Cenobites are like all of these hedonists get completely bored out of their skull with earthly hedonism. Do you mean Hellraiser? Hellraiser, yeah, that's exactly, it was, it, the book was, the something something heart was the name of the book. But yeah, they, they get so bored with earthly pleasure that they try and seek out the perfect sensation of the Cenobites. And like, this is absolute hell. Like you try and be logical and rational to maximize pleasure. It, you are constantly chasing that dragon and you never ever get there. And, but, and the whole time you're chasing it, you just keep descending lower and lower, which, which goes again, back to that thing that if you're, you're aiming for the moon, if you're aiming for heaven, you know, earth will be tossed in. Like you'll, you'll have some pretty good stuff on earth, but it's because you're aiming for heaven. If you're aiming for Earth, you just dive straight down to hell. Exactly. E exactly. You know, um, with the idea of, you know, virtue and everything and, and pleasure, it reminds me again of the ancient Greeks, right? Aristotle said that man was a rational animal. And, of course, the animal appetites of sensual pleasure, drink, food, sleep. When, when men, when men, uh, devote their reason to it. It's 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 a um, it's a rejection of our nature. Man using his reason to gratify his animal appetites would be an anathema to even the Epicureans, who were we often mistakenly confused with hedonists. They did believe in pleasure maximization, but he, but even they argued that you know man is a rational animal, and therefore his reason should be used for rational pursuits. And when we use our reason to meet, you know, as Hume said, uh, reason under the control of passion. Desire, when desire dictates reason, everything's out of whack. You know, as Plato said, you know, we have the, the rational soul. Well, there's actually it's Aristotle. There's the tripartite soul. There's the rational, spirited, and repetitive parts of the soul. Uh, the rational part of the soul is that part of the soul which is, you know, reason and self-control and discipline. The appetitive app, the, the spirited element is what's what the Greeks called thumos. It's it's like the uh, the horse running across the field, or you know, in Aristotle's sense, it might have been the warrior on the battlefield, or it might have been the uh, the hunter in the hunt. And then there was, of course, appetite, which was of course necessary. We need to eat, we need to reproduce, we need to drink. But that was the lowest part of the soul. And now we've turned it upside down where the lowest part of the soul is on top and reason is on the bottom. And, it, and the great irony is this is called the age of reason. Where we have gone absolutely irrational. It's the age of reason, and yet our gold standard of reason is peer review, which is just an exaggerated form of democracy. You know, this scientific paper is true because a whole bunch of people rubber stamped it. They all like the author. That's our definition of truth. That, that's the scientific method has gone from, you know, a disciplined form of thinking that you're going to hold yourself to into a democratic, this is what everybody believes in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've been going for about an hour. Um, I think it's close to wrapping up. Do you have any final words you want to leave us with? Well, it's, uh, <laughs> I, well, I'd say like, you know, guys, I'm really not trying to hold myself up as an exemplar. I'm trying to be less of an asshole today than I was yesterday and trying to define virtue. Again, it's, it's like trying to, you can't capture God in the box. All right. Virtue is that endless thing, but we, we all need to be pursuing it, you know, and it, it's such a, it's such a razor's edge on the one side, you know, I know that. There are so many people that want to call weakness virtue, and that's not virtue. I mean, good Lord, the word virtue stems from the word vir, which means a heroic man, not just a male, but a man. And uh, but at the same time, you can't fall into arrogance and, you know, and ugliness. It's, you know, we got to walk that razor's edge of trying to be more than ourselves, like acting in this world, but not of this world. And, uh, you know, and <laughs> good luck doing that, but you got to do it anyway. Well, thanks for joining me, Davis. It was a wonderful chat. This is Todd Lewis of the Praise of Folly podcast signing off.